Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stuart Lang. I'm chairman of the anglo Romani Society, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening, wherever you may be, and I expect scattered uh, all over the world, to hear Dr. Robert Bewley talk about aerial archaeology in Oman and the Middle East. Talking to Robert just before uh, this began, um, I was not quite sure whether he's a really an aviationist or an archaeologist. Uh, and the great delight of this lecture is that we're going to hear a combination of the two. As you will have seen in the email handout uh, before the lecture, he was until very recently director of the Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa project at Oxford University and was also before that uh, was set, set up the uh, aerial archaeology in Oman, having been a co-director of the aerial archaeology project in Jordan. So he has bags of experience in the Middle East, bags of experience in the air, and extensive knowledge of archaeology. And we look forward to hearing this wonderful combination from you, Robert. Uh, and many thanks for joining us, for uh, giving us the benefit of your experience and wisdom. And I hand it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Stuart, and also thank you to the Society for inviting me. I think it's probably the longest uh, invite I've ever had. It was nearly two years ago that they said, could I give a talk on uh, aerial archaeology in Oman? And I, I think I'd done one flight almost at that time, so it was a bit of a risk, but I'm very pleased to do it. And um, I'm hoping to talk for about 50 minutes. I believe there'll be some questions at the end. Because I've got 50 minutes, I'm going to go at a fair old speed. So uh, I'm going to take you on a journey. And Stuart's already introduced it very well because it is a journey of both of both flying and archaeology, but predominantly archaeology. Um, uh, Robert, sorry, could I just interrupt? Yes. Um, there is an opportunity, of course, for people to put their questions uh, in the um, in the chat uh, or in the Q and A. Better in the Q and A box at the bottom of your bottom of your screens. A couple of people have submitted questions already um, in email in advance, by email in advance. Uh, so um, yes, please uh, stick to your 50 minutes, Robert, because yep. we want to have so time for that. those questions. Definitely, that's good. Okay, um, let's have a look. Should be able to, there we go. Uh, so the background to the journey, and it was difficult to know whether to put this in now or later, but I, I studied archeology span initially at Manchester and then was lucky enough to go to Cambridge. And I show this photograph because the great thing about Manchester was it had Near Eastern archeologists. And I was very interested in that in my third year there. Uh, but it also had a professor who taught aerial archeology, span one of the very few in the country way back in 1975, was it? Yes, 1975. Um, and I had hoped uh, to have spent more time in the Middle East in those early years, but I was lucky enough, as you can see here, to go to Iraq in 1978, and that was when my interest really, or rather my love of the area, um, grew, and I was also in Iran as well, so for many years I'd hoped to be able to work there, um, but circumstances, as often happens in the Middle East, uh, prevailed, and I wasn't able to do the PhD I was going to do on the Zagros Mountains. So I had to find a second string to my bow, and that was looking at aerial uh, photographs, as you'll see in a minute. But what I wanted to just introduce the whole subject, which is this photo, the photograph uh, of Stonehenge in 1906, uh, shows not only the stones in a not very good condition. If you look very closely, you will see there are wooden stays holding up the stones. Um, but the significance is the fact that the ditch, the outer ditch of the henge, shows us a different colored mark. And for archeologists looking at it, particularly one archeologist, OGS Crawford, uh, he was able to show that, that the difference in vegetation can help us discover archeological sites. And this was the birth of what we now call aerial archeology. span um, The other point of putting this on is that it doesn't matter whether it's a World Heritage Site or a very small site somewhere else. We are about, as archeologists, we're about monitoring change. And so uh, here we see it in 1906, but also in 2017. And although I'd photographed Stonehenge a number of times when I worked for English Heritage as head of aerial survey, uh, in 2017, I was able to actually be the pilot of the aircraft and photograph it from the air, which was great fun. Um, it's right on the edge of Salisbury Plain training area. So you have to be very careful and make sure you don't get lost. 
which I very nearly did. Um, I show this slide just to show that my PhD was on, uh, having thought I was going to do a PhD on the Paleolithic of the Zagros Mountains, I decided to choose somewhere much safer, uh, which was the Solway Plain in Cumbria. I was about to go to the Zagros Mountains exactly the week that Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. And uh, we know what a, a disaster for both countries that was. So I ended up doing prehistoric settlement in Northern England using air photographs, which is how my knowledge of aerial archaeology and the use of those photographs began. I was then uh, able to luckily get a job where the, the British, the English government, but the British government too, um, paid me to do aerial survey and probably the best job that for me you could have, you could have imagined. Um, the questions we were always asked is, is it value for money? And the answer is yes, you can record more sites per hour in the air than any other form of survey. Um, I suppose sitting in front of a computer screen, pinning it using satellite imagery, but we'll come on to that. Um, and it's about two things, as I've mentioned here, discovery and protection. And the theme running through this talk is discovery and protection. One of the things we did in English Heritage was set up uh, a programme that was called the National Mapping Programme just for England, because there were over two million air photographs uh, in their archives of English heritage, now historic England. And as I was not only adding to that archive, I was thinking, well, what are we gonna do with the two million, archive, two million photographs we've got already? And um, many of them were taken uh, before, during and after the Second World War. They were a record of a landscape that had changed. And therefore we wanted to record those sites with a view to being able then to prioritize which sites were the most important for protection. And since the Second World War, the, the medieval landscape of England has been, I mean, more than decimated. It has been completely obliterated. And there are only now a small handful of the medieval townships uh, that have remained uh, unplowed and are protected now by law, which is a, 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 in one sense, a great shame that there's so few of them, but at least we have a small sample. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, 1989-1990, uh, we were asked by many uh, former Soviet countries if we could uh, come and teach them the, the principles of air photography and the principles of mapping from our photographs. And, and although this may look like a sort of bombing map of Europe, it's not at all. It's showing the countries that, that became involved in what was a Culture 2000 project. So for most of the 90s, I spent a lot of time in Europe either part of a team training people to do air photography or mapping using the existing air photographs and as you'll see way down on the bottom right hand corner uh, we also did some work in in Jordan and published this book aerial archaeology developing future practice and uh, that was published in 2002 with a grant from NATO uh, the contrast between Europe if you like and the Middle East is that in Britain and Europe we have um, my European colleagues hate it when I use the word Britain and Europe because they say, Bob, you're part of Europe. Yes, but that was before Brexit, dear friends. Um, and the difference is that the crop mark sites uh, are visible because of the soil and because that although they may have been upstanding uh, in this site, in this photograph, you're seeing the uh, Bronze Age ring ditches and uh, Roman sites here. They, although they've been ploughed away and they used to be earthwork and upstanding, they still exist beneath the soil. In the Middle East and North Africa, as you will see, uh, much more to do with stonework and mudwork and therefore, and mud brick, and, and they survive or, unfortunately, if ploughed or bulldozed, completely destroyed. So it is a different type of, of archaeology. Um, uh, Stuart in the introduction mentioned aerial archaeology in Jordan. I got an email from David Kennedy, who you can see here, uh, saying um, that he had had one flight in a helicopter courtesy of the Jordanian Air Force and he'd had he got my name and we knew each other vaguely anyway because we'd both been at Manchester um, and he said would I like to come and help him in Jordan we thought it would be a two or three year project um, and ever since 1997 apart from 2020 because of Covid uh, we have flown every year in Jordan uh, but unfortunately in 2020 we weren't able to even though we had all the uh, resources and capability of doing it and part of David's interest was Roman archaeology in Jordan but clearly we knew that from uh, 
historic air photographs, there were other important archaeological sites uh, that were possible to record from air photography. Um, I just put this one in of the, the pyramids in Egypt because it is such a wonderful photograph um, and taken by um, aviators who were doing a vertical survey but because they enjoyed what they were doing, they also took oblique photography. And there are two types of air photographs, oblique and vertical. And uh, the, what, what I'm showing you is the opportunity to record using oblique photographs, simply with a handheld camera leaning out of a vehicle of some sort, either an airplane or a helicopter. Um, for those of you interested in a little bit of the history, this is one of the books when Barry Jones was teaching us aerial archaeology, the reading list was half a page of A4. And luckily, there's a really good library in uh, Manchester University, so we were able to get them out of the library. And just to see this one, which is to do with, as you can see, aerial archaeology in Algeria. But the subtitle is Fossatum Africae. There was part, this was part of the Roman Empire, and there was a ditch that was dug all the way along uh, North Africa to de delimit the, the, the Roman Empire and the zone of Roman Empire, so part of the Limes. And then there was also this famous publication by Antoine Poitabar, um, La Trace de Rome dans le désert de Syrie. Uh, Poitabar was a fascinating character. He was either an archeologist or an engineer or a Jesuit priest or a spy and probably the latter, but the quality of his photographs is stunning. So if, if you do nothing else after this lecture, but find a copy of that book in the library, you will, it will, it, you, you will be absolutely amazed. It's a stunning book. Um, as is this one, Flights Over the Ancient Cities of Iran by Eric Schmidt, published in 1940. They did the work in the 1930s and actually took this aircraft out to Iran to be used as a taxi because they were digging at Persepolis. And they thought, well, we'll fly from Tehran down to Persepolis. But um, Eric Schmidt's wife, Mary Helen, um, who was from Philadelphia in, uh, in America, for some reason, and I've not found the reason yet, uh, she knew about aerial archaeology. And she said, well, you must do aerial archaeology. And uh, the, the photographs they took are stunning. This is one of Persepolis. Um, and if you can see at the bottom of the screen, it says April the 20th, 1936 at 8.09 a.m. His record keeping was phenomenal. This is all done uh, by hand. I've seen his, his pencil notebooks uh, at an altitude of 1,068 meters and a hundredth of a second. And that's a photograph of Persepolis um, from 1936. And he says in his book, that it was the aerial photographs that was able to transform his understanding of where they should excavate and 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 actually they surveyed the large parts of Iran over a thousand photographs were taken um, and just want to come back to the Jordan project just to say that all the photographs were taken are on this website and we'll come back to that at the end as well uh, over a hundred thousand images um, and Part of the reason for doing it was the Jordanians wanted us to publish a book, which we did, promoting the heritage of uh, Jordan from the air. And it's the same thing as we want to do in uh, Oman, which is publish a book on ancient Oman from the air. And as you'll see in a minute, I will admit my ignorance about Oman compared to some other areas, but you're never too, never too old to learn. So I will continue learning. And I wanted just a couple of pictures of Jordan because it is about discovery. This was uh, a possible hill fort, as you can see uh, here with the ramparts here and either a burial or here, possibly some uh, settlement inside it. And it's wonderful when you find something new like that, but if you zoom out a bit, you realize somebody had been there before. And this is actually in a fairly remote part of Jordan, not far from the uh, border with Saudi Arabia, but a bulldozer, Unfortunately, the bulldozer driver decided it was easier to go around it and carry on than to go straight through it. Thank heavens for that, because we actually have no idea what date this site is. Um, and clearly it, it was for some reason under threat. Um, and we think these are um, ge geophysical prospections uh, looking for whatever it might be, oil or gas. Um, other sites like this one, this is a site down in Marn in Southeast Jordan, uh, an Islamic caravanserai. You can see that it's it's there's a lot of activity going on around it, but that's what it was like in 2003. And there's the same same site in 2018. Half of it destroyed, and the stone used to build up a mound so they can put the uh, water tanks, as you can see here, water tanks to be able to feed the olives. Uh, so 
there is a the pace of change in the Middle East, North Africa is huge. And then finally, uh, just on Jordan, wanted to show that we still find new sites. This is a site within 10 miles of, of the, the modern city of Amman. And it's a Roman quarry that no one knew about. We were able to photograph it and hopefully it will be protected because it's called Sahab Quarry, but not surprisingly, modern quarries on the south of it and the processing area to the north of it. So the pressure on that land is huge. So it's very important that we can record these things. And it's not the kind of place that people would be wandering around. Uh, so actually it was the aerial photographs that, that drew us to it. And uh, just want to mention very briefly the Endangered Archaeology Project, which uh, stretches from Mauritania to Iran, which is looking, uh, I've put here, voyage of discovery and documenting damage and destruction. So it's trying to find archaeological sites, a project um, funded by Arcadia, a charitable fund of Elizabeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin, and based in the University of Oxford, Durham and Leicester, and uh, a clearly a very ambitious project. It started in 2015. Um, and will now continue until 2024. As, you said, as it shows here, 20 countries, over 10 million square uh, kilometers. And it looks, it uses satellite imagery predominantly, but it also looks at uh, um, historic air photographs. Here's one of Hatcher in the 1930s, and then Hatcher again in April 2015, just at the point at which um, ISIS, Daesh, was trying to do its worst in the center of Hatcher. Um, they did some damage, but overall, this very, very important Parthian city uh, wasn't destroyed. So for the Endangered Archaeology Project, over 309,000 records uh, of archaeological sites um, since 2015, that, that they're really the beginning of what is a much longer journey, which is a, would be the topic of a different talk. Um, but I did also, because we're talking about Arabia, um, and I will mention Saudi Arabia, I didn't want to... Um, ignore Yemen because uh, obviously the civil the, the war in Yemen started in 2015 similar time to our project so we've we've done a lot of work in Yemen and a wonderful site being discovered um, I'm very grateful to my colleague Dr Michael Fradley for sharing these slides with me but you can see the outline here of an archaeological site and if you look very closely you can see that within the um, within the red area which is the, the rampart you can see there are other features here and here. And that's just one of many sites. Here's another one, uh, fortified, as we said here, fortified well-preserved settlement in the Damar governorate, possibly Bronze Age. But the, and these sites not only need recording for archeological research and our understanding of the, the past human settlement of Arabia, but also uh, recording for protection as well. And just a, a, a photograph here of um, an archive that came to our attention from the McLeish family um, showing this with wonderful port city and you can see the, 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 the ramparts of it. And then when you look on the satellite imagery, uh, massive change. This is, this is um, in the early 2000s uh, and you just can't see those ramparts anymore. So it is about monitoring change. As archeologists, we know we can't preserve everything, but we want to try and record as much as possible before it's destroyed. Um, and then we've also got money from the British government to do a training program through the Cultural Protection Fund. Uh, and, and the aim is there is, is to try and protect the heritage, to train and, cap and, and show people that, that it's possible to train and then raise awareness through uh, the third thing here, which we've said, education and advocacy. But the purpose of today's talk is really to talk about Oh man, and this project wouldn't have got off the ground if it hadn't been for my colleague, uh, Sufyan al Karema, who, although Jordanian, had been working in Oman, and he heard me give a few talks and said, how about we try and get a project going in Oman? Through his contacts, we were able to do it, and uh, I'll, I'll do the full acknowledgements at the end. Um, but if it hadn't been for Sufyan's contact, this project would never have got off the ground. So thank you for that. And, and here's the, the, my admission of, of wanting help. Um, I've said here, any names, places, words, I'm very happy to be corrected. I'm not an expert in Oman, but learning. Um, my expertise is more in aerial archeology. span uh, And when I gave a talk um, to the Anglo-Yemeni Society, um, luckily, Tony Walsh, who wrote the guidebook to Oman was there. And we, we're in fairly, constant touch about various things so feel free to get in touch with me afterwards if there are places you would like me to photograph or like us to photograph uh, or any knowledge of places that you think we should be exploring 
Um, quick mention of the team, it's, it's done in conjunction with the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. So we've got Amira, Nasser, and there's a picture of Sufyan and Walid, and uh, just a picture of me to show that we, there we are, bright and breezy at something like 5.30 in the morning before we go flying. Um, just a brief word about the helicopters, the routes, the sites, and the cameras. Um, here's Sufyan just posing uh, on the helicopter we had in the first year, which was 2018. Uh, a Puma uh, aircraft and helicopters are a really good platform for doing aerial photography. It's great if you can, uh, as we have done in Jordan and in Oman, use a military helicopter because military personnel can go to places that often civilians can't. And uh, all the photographs we took were not vetted by the military, but we showed every photograph. So if there was anything that was sensitive, we would say to them, well, we'll either delete it or make sure we never show it. So that was, it was a really good cooperation and it just proved it could work. Um, in the second season, 2019, for one day we had an NH-90, which is a European helicopter that's, that, that is actually very fast, but not as fast as a Super Lynx, but big enough to take three or four people. And the more people you have in the aircraft, the more photographs are taken and the more archaeology is seen. The Super Lynx, which is the, it's a British built air, uh, helicopter, when it was built it was the fastest helicopter uh, ever built, which is great, but it's a very small one so you can only take two people. Um, that means for an efficient way of operating, but, but given that, that so far the Royal Air Force of Oman has given us access to these helicopters for free, then uh, we're very grateful for anything we can get. Uh, we plan all our routes in advance, we upload them to GPS, and then we tell the pilots uh, which, which route to fly. Uh, this is the route on the 15th of February, 2018, uh, the red line that you can see, and that was effectively the trial flight. Um, very, very exciting to be able to do it when you've never been to a country before um, and you were invited in, it's a huge privilege. Um, and to see just the, the contrast in landscapes and also the stunning archaeology was just an honor indeed. Um, and there we are, the track log as we call them and the targets for 2019. At the moment, we've only really worked in the Bettina Governorate, Governor, but ultimately uh, post pandemic, we're hoping to be able to cover the whole country. Um, and then there's a detail of the track log. So one of the things you need as an aerial archaeologist is a very strong stomach. And um, I won't embarrass any of the team to show pictures of them with the aftermath of uh, not having a strong stomach. But it, it is, I'm just lucky, I very rarely get sick in the air. Um, but as you can see here, there is lots and lots of orbiting to be done. Um, and the pilots are fantastic. They, 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 they think we're mad, um, but after a couple of hours, they go, well, this is actually quite interesting. Um, I wanted just to show this because uh, obviously the thing about, one of the things of Oman is it's got a very, very long coastline um, and it isn't just about recording archaeological sites, it's also recording change. And these are the small um, fishing uh, setups, um, small, fish, for, small fishermen going out in their boats um, just up the north coast near Soha. Um, and I wanted to record them because part of the Endangered Archaeology Project, which has now developed, is the Maritime Endangered Archaeology Project being run by Lucy Blue and teams from Southampton and Ulster. And, 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 and they're looking at the coastal zone and the changes in the coastal zone and any archeology span that you can see under the water. So it is both on land, on sea and in the air, which is fantastic. And to continue the not just archeology span theme is the Bimmer sinkhole, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, and if you look very closely in there, there is somebody swimming down there. I haven't visited that on the ground, but there's a, a somewhere I wish to visit in the future. Um, and, the thing that struck me, obviously, was the number of castles and towers. I believe there are something like 5,000 towers in Oman and 3,000 castles. So that's 8,000 sites. And we've probably recorded in, in the small amount of work we've done so far, we've probably recorded maybe 100, maybe 150. Um, so there's a lot more research to be done. 
Some of them are in very good condition, uh, as these are some in, in a variety of conditions. And I think that recording them from the air is a really good thing to do. Some of them show well on satellite imagery, but many don't. Uh, so actually recording them as part of the national record of the archaeology of Oman is a really good one. Um, what struck me in many of the sites that we were asked to go to is that here you've got a fort, but it's a mud brick fort. Um, and, and, and modern development has encroached is perhaps the wrong word, but sort of smothered uh, most of the internal bits. And so th these may well not survive very many more years. And, and there may be ground photos of them, but, but to be able to record them from the air, I think is a really good way of showing what they are. And what I'm showing you today is one or two photographs. Generally, we will orbit a site and take a number of photographs uh, so that you record it from every different angle. Um, and all of these photographs, copies of these photographs are in the ministry. Uh, we left a hard drive with them all on. Um, here's another one. And many of the castles, as those of you who know Aman well, will know that they've been restored and are very, very uh, interesting to visit um, as tourists or just as uh, local residents. Um, I wanted to show this one, a tower here, to show that uh, many of them are also in areas where there's a lot of activity going on. And it looks, I mean, what, what impressed me on my first visit to Oman was just how um, well, well looked after the majority of the heritage was. And there's a huge range of heritage, um, but it has been very well looked after so far, which is a really, uh, you know, here's another one, Haby Castle, which I've not only visited from the air, um, and you can see, you know, clearly uh, very well restored. And then some of the other features around it um, and the water systems as well. Uh, so very important. And this is just to show as well that we photograph, we do go around and orbit them uh, and show them in a different, in, in, in as many different ways in which we can. But it isn't just the castles and the towers. Um, uh, obviously here you can see some, but also uh, whether these are of the same date or earlier, um, I don't know, but further research would obviously show whether they were. Um, but it's important to show it in its landscape context as well. It's not just the sites. And one of the, the problems that our, as archaeologists and people protecting it have is that the, everybody wants to focus in on, on a site and the, and the main features, but actually it's looking at the landscape as well because the sites don't, don't exist in, in isolation. They, they, they need the water, they need the land on, you know, that, that, that this fort wouldn't be important if it wasn't for the greenery down here and the people living here as well. So it's trying to understand them in their landscape context and, and our, an aerial archaeology can help you do that. It is only a start, it is not the end. There's more to be done. Um, I put this one in because there are many uh, circular structures where when you're orbiting, and sometimes we're only spending two or three minutes at these sites, you, you take the photograph because you're not sure whether you're photographing geological marks or archaeology. And uh, some of these, I am in reliably informed, they are definitely archaeology, um, but not all of them will be. And um, as I come to the end of the talk, you'll see uh, that, that in the work we've been doing in Saudi Arabia just very recently, um, that was really the case. And often we'd be orbiting and, and two of us, one of us would say, no, that's geology, and one would say archaeology. And then we look at the photograph afterwards and we'd say, yes, definitely archaeology. So it, it, it's about recording it, much better to record it in, the, in that rare opportunity. Um, and, and you have to take the opportunities when you can, as the pandemic has shown, because I, I, every time I fly in the Middle East, I think it's going to be my last flight. Um, luckily, we've been doing it now for 20 odd years. Uh, so in fact, 25 years. So uh, hopefully it will continue. Um, and here's other examples of archaeological sites that, that may not set the world on fire, but these are sites where communities were living two, three, four, five, even 6,000 years ago. Um, so for archeologists, they're very important. And again, if somebody wanted to, to build on them, they're probably not important enough to say, oh, you can never build on it, but there ought to be some archeological research done before they are developed. And also I think people are interested to know um, how old they are and why people were living there. Um, and what and what and you know what resources and obviously here this is something that's related to the coast so that's very important and there's a detail of them often quite small sites 
um, probably settlements, uh, some of them will be burials. Now, this was a site that I was completely uh, surprised and blown away about. And I think it's called the Jebel Kahwan. If anyone's got a better name, please let me know. Um, it, it came, we came across it, across it by, almost by accident and surprise, but you can see there's this massive cliff and then on top, uh, some archeology. span I think the access is, is through here and along the top, but um, what is it about human beings that we have to live and build things on these incredibly difficult places? Um, and there's a, there's a detail of it, um, a rock cut, something or other, but system for water, and, and are these buildings as well? Um, there is, a, there is a site in Petra in Jordan, and, and there's an archaeologist claims that uh, basically the, 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 I was going to say king, but it probably was the king, um, decided that he would use the hilltop, um, uh, he used the hilltop as a place that he would have a bath, and that there was a public demonstration of the king cleansing himself. So who knows, but this is an amazing site. Uh, other places like this, uh, uh, Suhaila Fort, um, wonderful site on the top of a hill. Um, and although we've said fort, um, it's a hilltop settlement. I don't see an outer wall necessarily defending it. Um, so again, if anyone's got more information, please do get in touch right close to the road. Other sites here, uh, this is on the edge of a wadi, uh, where you can see what looks like a settlement and field systems as well. Um, and the, the, one of the problems with aerial archaeology is we record so many sites very quickly that it, A, you couldn't do it from the ground, but also, and slightly frustrating from our point of view, the chances of us ever going to visit even 1% of these on the ground is very small. So that's why I say it's a beginning and that, that we ha I feel as aerial archaeologists, we have to be generous and say, these, are, these photographs are not for us. We're never gonna be able to, to look at them. These are for other people to take them forward and, and, and look at them. Uh, one of the hardest things to photograph from the air are canats, which are the, um, the shafts for the management of water um, and Sufyan's particular interest was in, in water management. Um, and you need to have exactly the right light. I haven't gone into the detail of, of the lighting, but the lighting is absolutely crucial, which is why we plan our seasons in both Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia and Oman for later, either later in the year or earlier in the year. So anytime between October and March, but for Oman, I think it's really December or January. Some of the photographs you've seen were taken in January, 2019, and the others were taken in February because the, the, especially the nearer the equator you get, um, the, the sun rises so high and so quickly that you, you and, and although in this one, there's not much direct sunlight, it's probably a slight, a slight cloud, you need to be able to get to, to fly at those times of year while you've got the strongest uh, light from, from the side. Um, and that says I'm halfway through the journey, which is pretty good because um, I'm actually further than halfway. Uh, we also try and work with other archaeologists where they're uh, doing excavations. Um, and this is a detail of excavations as well. And uh, so we would always put out a call before we, we, we uh, go back to say if, if anybody wants to photograph uh, sites that they're either surveying or excavating, then uh, it's a very good way to do it. And I think in Jordan, we've, we've liaised with over 100 archaeologists over 20 years, which is really good. And there's the site in, in context. Um, and even recording changes at uh, World Heritage Sites, uh, as in this one here. Um, fantastic. I mean, a privilege to fly over this site. And it's such a large site. Um, I, we had to go high and the great thing about a helicopter is you can go on up and down very quickly um, but to try and get it all in was quite a challenge but we managed to do it and it's not as if we're going to record much new but at least you can show the development of the site and things that will change on it um, and there's the Bibi Mariam mausoleum um, and I love the quote from Ibn Battuta it had fine bazaars and one of the most beautiful mosques um, and uh, that shows how things not only survive but also change over time and I just wanted to mention uh, this work as well about the this is from uh, Dr Will Dedman from Durham University and Will was lucky enough to be brought up in um, Oman lived there as a youngster but then did his PhD on the Hafiq tombs 
and uh, he doesn't know I'm going to say this because I only thought of it today, but if you wanted somebody to give a talk about his work on the Hafi tombs, it's a really good talk. Um, so he gave it to us as part of the Endangered Archaeology Project. And I said, can I borrow a couple of your slides? Um, really interesting stuff. Um, these tower tombs from the fourth and third millennium BC. Uh, here we have some of the ground photographs um, and he, his, his research uh, looks at the uh, the number of them and then the date of them and the distribution of them um, and then you can see them on the, the, the bottom right hand side destroyed and robbed uh, there's an awful lot of archaeology there and uh, we we we, did, we have recorded some of it from the air which I'll show in a minute um, but it shows that that you need that combination of both aerial field and research archaeology and here just a, a number of I'm not claiming these are necessarily Hafiq tombs um, but certainly the, the, the number of these is phenomenal across the landscape. And you can get some quite detailed, uh, uh, some detailed photographs uh, of the sites. And there they are more in the landscape context. Um, some other ones by a main road here, these U-shaped things, uh, which are fascinating. And I'm sure these will have been excavated in advance of this massive road construction uh, up near Soha, which we'll uh, come back to later. Um, just a, a couple of little photographs here, just to say that it's important to keep the happy team and well, uh, keep, keep the team happy and well fed, because although people think it must be great fun to do this, it is actually really hard work. Um, flying sometimes four, five, six, seven hours a day, um, and it, it is a privilege to do it, but you need to be uh, pretty fit and well fed. And uh, there's a picture of Sufyan looking very happy. Um, and, and this is also just to acknowledge the pilots. Um, they do a phenomenal job because normally pilots, especially helicopter pilots, they like to fly low and fast. And we want them to fly high and slow. And they go, oh, this is so boring. But actually, they, they, they enjoy it. But they do a really good job because all the time we're constantly saying to them, turn left, turn right. No, it's another mile on and everything else. Um, and they were just fantastic. And really, we were made to feel very, very welcome. Um, and I have mentioned field survey. We were able to go out with a team uh, that were doing a survey in the Wadi Al Jeezy. I think it's Jeezy. I'm just, yes, yeah, Wadi Al Jeezy. Um, and uh, able to look at some of the sites on the ground that we photographed. And so we've shared the photographs with that team as well. And as you can see, uh, that's the whole point, isn't it? You see that you see the sites in a completely different way uh, when you look on the ground. Um, and then also you do get some lovely sunsets as well. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit too about how we record it. Um, the site, it's all digital photography now. You can then download the photographs. We happen to use Lightroom. Um, and the reason I've, I've shown you this screenshot is that we are able to record uh, through a GPS, both on the camera, but also a separate GPS, record where we've been. So literally second by second, we know where we are. And even though we may not know the name of the site, we can geolocate it, which is really important. So they they go into Lightroom. Um, Lightroom has a map facility, so you can see the distribution. Um, so it's a very, very good way of recording the sites. And then we, uh, the, the plan is to upload the photographs to the APAMI website. And APAMI stands for the Air Photographic um, Aerial Archaeology Archive of the Middle East. And we'll come on to that uh, right at the very end. Um, and I just wanted to just, as I said in the abstract, just to do a quick diversion. When I was first asked to do this talk, um, 18 months, nearly two years ago, I had no idea that I might be able to do some air photography in uh, Saudi Arabia. I'd, I'd done one flight uh, really as a kind of um, tourist to do with the Alula project, but luckily the Royal Commission for Alula um, commissioned uh, initially David Kennedy and but now Hugh Thomas, Dr. Hugh Thomas, who kindly sent me these slides uh, to do some aerial survey. Because of the pandemic, they had trouble getting an Australian team out there. So in September said, Bob, would you like to join us in November to do some flying over Saudi Arabia? And uh, so I just wanted to show a few uh, slides of what we did and how we did it, because although there are modern borders, it's still Arabia. And a lot of the things, particularly when you look at the tombs and everything else, uh, a very, very similar um, type of archaeology. 
And so it, this is a kind of foretaste of the sorts of stuff that we may get in other places. And wouldn't it be wonderful one day to be able to do this in Yemen as well? Um, and Hugh is based at the University of Western Australia, the project funded by the Royal Commission for Alula, um, in, and it's also got funding from the Centre for Forensic Anthropology and the Australian National University. There's the team, um, and this year, uh, it was Hugh and Jane and Matt Dalton who were physically there. And uh, there's the team with the helicopter um, in one of the areas. And I was really just an interloper um, because I happen to know a little bit about air photography, but it was a privilege to be there, it really was. Um, and Matt Dalton, who's uh, um, Cambridge and UWA, just finished his PhD. And that's, um, that's obviously a stage photograph, but I said, let's stage a photograph so that people can actually know what it, what it would look like if they could see us in the air in detail. And uh, Matt sits on the edge and I fortunately have a slightly more comfortable seat. Um, and we're just photographing and uh, using handheld digital SLRs and then a, a GPS. You can see the GPS on our knees. Um, the thing about aerial archeology span is always have a backup. If something could go wrong in aerial work and aviation, it will. Um, and I won't go into this detail, but it's just to show the areas they were covering in Alula. And this is the old town of Alula, for those of you who know it, phenomenal story um, and a phenomenal history of Alula, but not for now. But the key thing about this slide is to show that it's everything from aerial to actual excavation and then the artifacts and try and get dating to try and understand them. And the great thing is we're able to land and do a quick survey, as you can see here, um, and, and other field, and we do field walking and Hugh does the drone photography. So it's bringing it down to the drone level, which is really, really important. And um, forgive my indulgence of me enjoying myself digging a tomb. I haven't actually got a trowel out for many, many years. But as often happens in these things, there are days when the helicopters aren't available for whatever reason. Uh, so I was asked if I could go and dig and empty buckets and do sieving and sand and everything, something I haven't done for probably 20 years, but thoroughly enjoyed it, as you can see from the smile on my face. This was just only three weeks ago. Um, and wonderful sites. I mean, I love that this is the only place I've seen in the world where there's triangular archaeology. It's so rare. And wherever there's a triangle, you know, where we want to look for a bullseye. Um, so clearly, I don't know whether this is anything to do with a male and a female or what, I do, we have no idea. Um, but whenever there's a triangle, there will be a bullseye. And whenever there's a bullseye, you're looking for the triangle. Sometimes they can be a kilometer or more apart, um, but it just happens over and over again. And uh, just, uh, I did mention the need for light. This was just coming back to land at Alula one night. Um, and we just, this is an amazing hilltop. Um, uh, settlement uh, right above Alula and the light was just catching it just right to just to show it up as an example uh, of what you can see um, and then numbers of these keyhole tombs which we only get in this part in Kaibar in this part of Saudi Arabia very interesting and uh, the big shock was the white volcano um, amazing amazing uh, piece of history in terms of uh, geological history and then uh, looking, there's the white volcano there. And then they found lots of these things, which they refer to as mustatils <coughs> or gates. And they will be uh, publishing an article on that very, very soon in antiquity. So we'll let you know when that's out because it's really interesting. Um, I, haven't, I don't know whether there are any of these in, in Oman, but I haven't seen any yet, but we'll certainly keep looking. Um, and then often on the edge of volcanoes, here's one of those bullseye with a huge great tail. Um, and we, there are many, many sites all the way from Yemen. I haven't seen many uh, pendant ones in Oman, but certainly they go all the way up into Jordan. Um, and, and we don't know what the tales signify, but they may be different generations of people who are buried there. Um, and then this is the famous Kaibar uh, keyhole ones. And it does seem as if they're defining uh, walkways and avenues, as you can see here. So the ends uh, you know, there's a relevance as to the fact that there's a passage coming through here. Um, and Matt's been uh, working on that and looking at that in detail. So it's fascinating stuff. Um, and then we came across, across this one, which was just the light was just stunning, shining off the basalt. Uh, and this is a, a, um, a volcanic area. And there's some more, which um, apparently they refer to as tadpoles. And uh, I couldn't not take a picture of Medin Salah and Hejra and the great Nabataean city uh, in, in northern, uh, northern Saudi Arabia. And there's the team there, which although it's not military, it's a, it's a government sponsored helicopter company 
And again, the pilots were really good. Um, Aziz here wants to now become an archeologist, but I, I think he was only joking. Um, so how do we measure success in aerial archeology? span um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll finish in a couple of minutes. Uh, so far in Oman, we've done 14 hours, four flights, 4,700 photos, probably 250 sites recorded. Um, new sites discovered, the answer's many and the research is ongoing. But the important thing is that we, we have obtained information about archeological sites, their size, the shape, the state of preservation. Um, and as I've emphasized, we've got their location, but it's only a start. Uh, longer term, the main thing is how many people are using the aerial photographs that we take. Um, and often they, as I've, as I've mentioned, they're individual sites, but they do sit in a landscape context. And often when you pull back, um, you can see the landscape is one under enormous uh, pressure. Here, this is a fantastic. Uh, this is the, you know, that, the road that runs from uh, uh, Muscat and goes north all the way. I mean, that is some construction there. And, uh, and you can see there's archeological sites here. Many, I know that uh, many of them were excavated in advance of, of a lot of the road work. So a man has a very good track record when it comes to that. Um, and I just put this one on because it's just one of my favorite sites of, of probably anywhere that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. Um, it's a remarkable site. Um, so the next steps, the plan is that we will, uh, we were hoping to be there in 2020, but the pandemic has meant there's a delay. We have some funding for 2021 and I've applied for more, so I'll know more in, um, in the spring. Uh, we need to cover greater areas of Oman. We need to target the main sites for Oman because we haven't done that yet uh, for the Oman from the air book. Um, and as I said, we, we, the other thing is also training because there is a shortage of aerial archeologists worldwide. Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? But it's absolutely true. And the more people we can train to both <laughs> interpret satellite imagery, but also be able to get into the air and take aerial photographs, I think the better for everybody because it's, an, it's, it's not only a wonderful thing to do, it's making a massive contribution to our understanding of archeology. span um, And the next steps, we're obviously, as I say, are waiting for the pandemic to recede. Uh, we hope we can get to Oman in, in December, 2021. And as I've already mentioned, if, if there are sites that you know about or would like us to photograph, please let me know. Uh, and that's my, my current email address. Hopefully it'll last for a little bit longer. Um, I do want to thank all the people in Oman who've helped us um, from their Royal Highnesses um, right down to uh, all the people who helped us on the ground. We've always been made to feel totally welcome and at home. Um, and it was just a great shame we weren't able to go in 2020, but we hope to be back in 2021. Um, we always take a team photo at the end of every flight. This was at the end of the first flight uh, and some very happy looking people. Um, but, and hot stop press as of today, um, the, the first flight from, um, uh, and I've made a mistake on that one, ignore that. Uh, but if you go to here on the Apami website, uh, 839 photos have been uploaded from uh, 2018 uh, and that's the, the, the February there, 15th of February, 2018. Um, I was hoping to get to a thousand, <coughs> but it actually takes um, an hour for 200 photographs to load. So I didn't want to be loading them while I was giving the talk. Uh, so hopefully very, very shortly, uh, all the photographs will be uploaded. I'm hoping to do it over the weekend uh, so that you'll get them on uh, through, through a Palmy. So if you go into uh, a palmy and you look at either photo stream or albums eventually you'll find that i am going to create an album that says oh man and then you'll find all the photographs in there um so there we are any questions 12 minutes to go robert thank you very much indeed this was really fantastic i'm sure you can hear the very loud applause uh, stretching over the ether uh, for me, it was wonderful uh, bringing back memories not only of oman but also in uh, early years of uh, Al Ula and Madan Saleh, which I visited oh, yes. in 1974 and then again in 1994. Uh, so it's, uh, these are all really very special places. We yeah. have plenty of questions for you. Okay. I'm going to start uh, with one that was submitted, a couple of questions submitted in advance, in fact, yep. um, before, before the lecture. Uh, and so this one you've partially answered, but I think you might like to expand on it. Yeah. Uh, 
Sonia Taha says, aerial photography with the aim of discovering new archaeological sites from low altitude mm. often works best in the UK at certain times of year, such mm. as late summer when the grass is parched or the crops mm. have been harvested. Yeah. Much of the Middle East however, is desert, as you've sh clearly shown us. Are there times of year, well, you've explained that, or levels of flight that are preferable for casting shadows in order to discern traces of buildings or yeah. post rooms? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you could probably fly any time of year, um, but you would have a very short window of early morning and late afternoon from sort of <laughs> from April through to October. So so the, for us um, in the Middle East, it's October through to March. And I think for Oman, it really is December, January. You might be able to do November to February, but but really December, January, you get the best results. That's the point. Um, and here's a question which I'm afraid uses an acronym that I'm not familiar with. I would uh, like to know, says Alison McKenzie, I'd like to know if DEM data is available for Oman. If yes, okay. has it been used for mapping all of the tomb locations? Finally, if it has been done, how many tombs are there and what does their distribution say about the climate at that Whoa. time? Whoa, wow, how long have you got? Um, I, think, yeah, yeah. I think for DEM, digital elevation models, I, the honest answer is I don't know for the whole of Oman what's available, but if I don't know whether Will Dead, Deadman is either, uh, he won't be able to contribute, but, it, but, but he will know better than I do. Um, but I don't think we know yet how many of the cans there are and their full distribution. Um, but actually, uh, that's why I'm glad I mentioned <coughs> Will's work, because he will know more than anyone. There's still many more to be discovered, I think, is the answer there. But 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 the approach that's being suggested is is obviously the right one. Yeah. Uh, you said a little bit about training uh, Omanis and, and uh, mm -hmm. people in the in the countries where you work. But perhaps you'd like to expand on that. This is a question. Are there collaborative efforts of local archaeologists and departments that aim to combine aerial photography and ground truthing? Yeah, um, there are. And we haven't done it in it, yet we haven't got it set up properly in Oman, but we have had funding from the Cultural Protection Fund, which is a British Council uh, project, uh, where we've worked in Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, Libya and Tunisia and Yemen to do exactly that. And the, the reason we haven't done Oman is that the through that project was that the Cultural Protection Fund only funds ODA projects um, which are clearly defined by the British government and Oman isn't one of them um, and that's why I was very keen to try and do the aerial archaeology there but if we can then through um, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage actually develop that that's that's really the way forward yeah and uh, here's a question which uh, we're asking you to speculate because um, um, which you can do orally which you probably wouldn't want to do in writing so it's about, the, about, it's about the bullseye and the triangle phenomenon. Mm -hmm. What guesses do archaeologists have for this phenomenon? And are there any other major mysteries in aerial archaeology which you uh, haven't covered? Which you'd like to <laughs> there are many. Um, okay, so, so what are our guesses? I mean, we think, we're pretty sure that it's to do with burial. The bullseyes we know are burials. Um, uh, there are others who are more expert in the triangles. We don't yet know the full distribution, but it's predominantly around the Kaibar area in Saudi Arabia. Um, there are one or two further north in Alula, but the, the research is still, I mean, it's so fresh and ongoing that I couldn't hand on heart say, well, it goes from X to Y and it's this wide, but, but we know it covers a fairly large area. Um, and what are the other major mysteries in aerial archaeology? Well, that's the point about a mystery we don't know. But I have been interviewed by the uh, Ancient Aliens program, where they wanted to say, wanted me to get, they wanted to get me to say that a lot of these things they refer to as petroglyphs. And I said, do you mean archaeological sites that are visible as stones? And they went, yes. Um, and I said, if you interview me, you won't be able to use anything that I say. And they said, why not? I said, because I don't believe in aliens. I don't believe these sites have anything to do with people looking at them from above. They weren't built for that because the people couldn't see from above because they're 5,000 years old. So you will interview me, and, and actually they did, um, and it took all day, and they didn't use, use the, the staff of my team were really worried that I was going to be quoted on an ancient aliens program. Um, 
and I wasn't, they didn't use any of it because I was a boring archeologist and I don't make any apology for being a boring archeologist. Gosh, the whole day. I hope you charge him a whacking great fee. Uh, oh yeah, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot, most of the stuff that you were showing us was in the North and East. Um, yes, have you yeah. done any work in Dauphar do you, and do you plan to? We definitely plan to if we can. We want to try and cover as much of Oman as we can purely depending on on the availability of both us as individuals but also what the air force can do and what we can do but, but yes definitely want to get down to dofa definitely yeah. um and i think this is probably one to end with um, or maybe not uh, anyway here's one so uh and this is a personal one if you had to pick the one most important development in the field since you started is it the ability to do uh, in, introduce much greater accuracy with the with GPS uh, or improve, improved accuracy of photography, or would it be something else? I think I, I think it's all of those. Uh, I mean, interesting when when um, flying in in uh, all these areas to think back to when I first started, we would be in an aeroplane with an ordnance survey map and a pencil line taking us from A to B. And then we did the photography as well. So the GPS was phenomenal. I would say probably the most important development in my career has been the development of LIDAR. And, and I didn't say at the beginning, but this talk that I've given you in 45 minutes, I have I've give, expanded it so I could take three days. Um, and obviously in the three day one, we talk about LIDAR and LIDAR is where you're firing literally hundreds of thousands of light beams a second at the ground from an aircraft and it's recording what's there. And that has transformed the way in which archeologists can understand the landscape beneath them. It doesn't replace air photography, it's an additional thing. And every time there's a new development they say, this is gonna replace aerial archeology span and, you know, or, or replace air photography, it's not. But, but the LIDAR is a really important development. And I would probably put that at the, the top, yeah. So can you, for me anyway, explain a yes. little more about that? Why is it so different? Uh, because it's, it's, it's actually firing a laser beam and recording uh, in, in, so for example, 10% of Britain is tree covered. So you can fire it over a forest and the first return gives you the top of the tree and then bits get the light goes through it, uh, through the trees and records what's in between the trees and using a computer, you can take the trees away and see the archeology span beneath. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the benefits. The other is, is going back to the first question, the LIDAR gives you that amazingly accurate digital elevation model. So you can map a landscape um, uh, because you've, you've taken effectively an objective recording. Everything I've shown you today is effectively my, or whoever took the photograph, subjective analysis of, well, I'm gonna take the picture from this point of view. With the LIDAR, it is, it, it, and it's, it, the reason it's not commonly available is that the machines cost 500,000 pounds. You've then got to get them in the airplane and the processing afterwards is massive. So um, yeah, I, I had to leave anything to do with LIDAR after the talk, otherwise we'd be here till nine o'clock mm. <laughs> or midnight in Oman. And this is, again, this is my question. I'm perhaps abusing my position as chair, but I'm, I don't apologize very much for that. So most of you haven't talked very much about dates. You did say mm -hmm. at one point, it were probably 5,000 years ago. And I suppose I, I was thinking third millennium uh, BC. Um, yeah. Have you reached, I mean, is, is that the case that this is, that's the kind of region of time that most of these things date to, except obviously from the, Portuguese forts and uh, and Omani yes, forts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think I think probably some of the archaeological sites will stretch back to the um, even even five thousand BC or six thousand BC. Um, the mustard teal I showed you in Saudi Arabia, they're saying it's six thousand years old or more. So so yes, they, they they will stretch back that 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 far. And generally in aerial archaeology, we're talking of <coughs> sites that that date from the Neolithic onwards. So, uh, and now you can push some of the Neolithic back to six or 7,000 BC. Um, so that, that's probably about as far as we dare go. But, but again, I need to do much more research personally 
on my understanding of early prehistory, which is what I'm interested in anyway, particularly in Oman, um, because there are Paleolithic. I mean, it's not that there aren't the earliest sites. There are. It's just that air photography isn't particularly good for finding Paleolithic or the or the you know upper Paleolithic sites. It's really just that our forte comes in once people start building either either building places for them to live that survive or building burials uh, that survive and predominantly across the Middle East uh, it's burials as it would have been in Britain too. And has this and the proliferation of settlements has this enabled you to form any come to any conclusions about a different climate at that time? Uh, I think not. Not yes, not uh, not just us. But the, one of the one of the amazing things was um, that we know we know by flying over a lot of these areas that, and especially after it rains, and we were lucky in Saudi Arabia in November, we had two massive thunderstorms, and then we actually saw the wadis flowing, and uh, fantastic to see that. But we know from our archaeological research that's been done right across Arabia that there were definitely periods when it was wetter and warmer, and they may have lasted. A few hundred years, they may have lasted a thousand years, but that's why that we've got these earlier settlements and these earlier occupations because the climate was different, mm. without a doubt. Um, we really are running are. towards the end of our time, but a lot of questions have been coming in, and I can't resist some of them. Um, so uh, here's one about tourism. Yep. Do you think the scope to incorporate aerial archaeology into Oman's efforts to increase tourism, and what might this look like? Or should, or do you think that aerial archaeology should really be limited to research? No, I think I, it. I mean, it depends how you mean for tourism. I mean, if, if by showing photographs in either books or um, uh, through social media and everything else, that people will go and visit them because that's fantastic. I think that's great as long as it's controlled and there's no damage done. Whether you could ever get, I would love to be able to get pe more people into the air so they could go around these sites in, you know, the best I want many, many years ago, I was able to go in an airship and an airship flies at 25 kilometers uh, an hour and or 30 or 40, depending, which is very slow. And you're in a lovely platform and you can go around the sites. The problem is you're not going to cover much of Oman in that period. So if there were lovely places, you, so there are there are lots of opportunities for, for getting people into the air. The problem with aerial archaeology is that hour by hour, it's not cheap. Renting a helicopter can cost $2,000 an hour or £2,000 an hour. So it's an expensive business uh, from that point of view. And do you find it difficult to get funding for, for, for this kind of work? Um, from the, yes, from the yes, and help from the Royal yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the point. So, so yes and no, but we've been lucky enough for the last 20 years to have been able to do it. But there's always, um, there's always a need for more money that you know we could spend longer there, you know, if we could, if the money was available. So often it is. And I saw just sorry, I've just seen an, a, a, a question from Nicholas Meller on, um, uh, are there plans for this to be used by Omani Educational Institute? And the answer is yes. Uh, we're still at very much the early stage, definitely. Um, two more quick, uh, I think just probably two more. One very quick one. In the context of the tombs, uh, could you explain the meaning of Hafit? The questioner knows it only as a place name. We talked about the Hafit tombs. I th uh, uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, Will would have to answer that, but I've always assumed it's it's actually a place name and, the, and that's why it's called that. Or, and, and I think it's to do with the, the, the period of time um, in Omani prehistory that's known as, as Hafid. So that, that's my understanding. Um, and one question would like a little more explanation about the Mustatil on the rim of the Wahla crater. Yeah. Um, Right. They're only a recent a discovery. Yeah, they're a recent discovery, but it does look as if they are some form of uh, both burial, but also processional way. And so Hugh Thomas and his team are working on uh, an article publishing what they think they are, um, because there's def they've definitely got uh, entrances and the, that the, the bit in between the two linear areas is sort of clear, and then there's activity at either end. Um, and they are reused also every time we visited a couple of them. I've only been to a couple, but they've been to many. Uh, they're reused in over time. So whatever there might be burial, later burials, 
but they we know they know from their research that they go back to seventh millennium bc so very interesting so watch this space for their publication on that one well i think we'll make this one the last one if i may and uh, with apologies to those whose questions haven't been answered so this is also from alistair mckenzie are the tomb locations random or are there nobility in the cairns higher up and on the layout he says that he has yeah. found some which appear to be the same as the plow is this yeah. likely or just random it's interesting uh, is he referring to the plow as the as a major the the constellation i'm not sure um i i think there is a hierarchy um I can't, I, for Oman, I don't know enough yet to be able to explain it, but there's certainly, it certainly seems to me that there are sites where the most important people are buried in these most important places. And, and, and there was, there's one I've seen, uh, again, it was in Saudi rather than Oman, where it was right on the top of a hill and the tail went right down into the valley and then up the other side and there was another one on the other side. So I'm thinking that's a king and a queen or a father and a son or a mother and a daughter, and that's their landscape. And they're saying, we're here, we're controlling it. So yes, I think there are hierarchies. And it, and it would be no surprise in terms of human history that the, the representation of a hierarchy is there in the building of monuments. That's, that's sort of what human beings have doing, been doing for a very long time, isn't it? Well, I think we will have to close, Robert. You've done uh, fantastically well. It was a very interesting talk um, and has provoked a very large number of questions. Uh, and you kept up your words per minute, I think, uh, in, both <laughs> Sorry. in the lecture and in the questions, which uh, was a remarkable achievement. And so on behalf of the Society, I would like to thank you very much for uh, a really, truly interesting evening. People often say this, but uh, this was really exceptional, I thought, and I'm sure Thank that you, people sure. out there will be saying so too. Um, and uh, you have brought those uh, distant millennia to life in a, in a very remarkable way. The combination of the aviation and the archaeology was uh, truly spectacular. Oh, so thank, thank you. you very much indeed. It and was my pleasure. To our audience, thank you to the organizers, to Sarika, hiding behind the emblem of the anglo Omani Society who yeah. set the whole thing up. Um, and above all, thanks to our lecturer, Dr. Robert Bewley at the University of Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Stuart.